uh, normally. Um, so welcome to whoever is joining this live. I thought that uh, Danny was going to be um, a co-host or co-guest with me, but that's not the case. So uh, looks like there is a first question, which is um, how has my natural movement journey evolved from when it first started to now at age 50? Um, I would, well, there's, it, I don't think it's a matter of age. Uh, it has changed, but it mostly has to do in my case, um, compared to when I trained, um, a lot and, uh, in so many ways, um, it was more like in my thirties, twenties, thirties, of course. And then I became a father and then I'm about to become a father of four. Right. So we're expecting, and which is a beautiful thing, but being a father, uh, did change the way uh, I train. Um, I, I not being a single man, obviously, I have less time, and so I have to be a little more strategic about that. So I do. It's more like by bits, more by bits, more than like a whole afternoon, or even sometimes it used to be whole days, whole afternoons, whole mornings, whole nights. Sometimes training. So it's more like um, opportunist kind of training. Uh, so that's one. Two, I also tend to um, take less risk because when you are a, a father, you have kids, you want to be able to, you know, move things around, uh, um, just move and um, you don't want to get hurt. So I'm a little more cautious about uh, taking risk. I take less risk, uh, but still enjoy tons of natural movement practice and all, all the benefits that, that come from, from that. Um, another question, whenever, whoever has a question, please type it. You want to type the questions. Just let me know. Another question would be, what would be the biggest piece of advice that I could give to someone uh, who's considering getting certified and not sure about it? I designed this curriculum uh, years ago, and, and then it was, you know, it keeps evolving because we have a fantastic team at MoveNet of highly, you know, driven and competent brilliant people and so that curriculum uh, has been taught for many years now and it keeps improving um, so why would you become certified when you learn for yourself you will learn a lot when you learn how to teach something that you believe you know to someone who doesn't know now, that's a huge difference. That's a huge difference because you start to really dig much deeper into your personal understanding of how such or such movement works and how you make it highly efficient and what could prevent it, every little detail that could prevent it from uh, being optimally efficient. So we're talking about technique. And so when you start to deal with teaching what you believe you know, what you, you, you know, but you start to teach to other people and you start to read their movement, you start to understand, okay, what, what's not proper here? What's inefficient? What's an issue with the movement, with the sequence of it, with the timing, with, with the position, with tension, with, with any aspect of, of the technique? You have to pay much more attention. You have to re-understand really how a certain technique, how a certain movement works. And it pushes you to, in fact, a much deeper, much more intimate understanding of each technique in every detail, 
much more than when you just learn it for yourself. And that's the beauty of this certification is that by wanting and having to learn how to teach, you better teach yourself. So even if you are not going to ever want to teach the movements, learning the certification, what we teach in the certification will teach anybody to learn for themselves better. Um, another question. Do you think today's fitness industry is green screening? Like it's more about money than health. So many fitness influencers market health foods that have terrible ingredients. Um, well, is there a green uh, greening of the fitness industry? Um, possibly. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure what's going on in, in, in the trends of the of the industry um, at MoveNet, we we know that we are part of an industry, but while never feeling that way or thinking that way, we are really at heart. We are educators. We really want to educate people and moving well. And by extension, MoveNet is 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 the natural movement lifestyle. It is about always has been about okay, find a moment and uh, frequently to go in nature. Go in nature, take off your shirt, get some sunlight, take off your shoes, get some some connection to the ground, um, practice on a fasted state, um, breathe better, uh, eat better, uh, sleep better, sleep more. Since the inception of MoveNet, every um, aspect of the whole healthy lifestyle has been uh, shared We've inspired people, we've advised people, we've uh, taught educated people about not just movement, not just natural movement, but a more natural lifestyle. So that's what we do. Um, that doesn't mean that we start selling products and supplements of all kinds. Um, that's not what we do. What we do is teaching people how to better move, um, how to move naturally again, how to become healthier in the process and how to also, when you start to pay attention to how you move, then you start to also pay attention to, okay, what else is it that I could do that I could change in my life towards more naturalness that would benefit me even further. And so that when it becomes the whole natural movement lifestyle. Um, to us, this is not a, a product, it's a, it's a mission. It's a heart condition. It's what we want people to experience to be healthy again or to be healthier than they are and to also find freedom of movement and joy and uh, a profound satisfaction a health that stems not just from buying a product and consuming a product but that stems from um, a connection with one's body connection with one's body in connection with nature and all, all the beautiful beneficial um sources of energy that are in nature. Um, can you give some indications about the general fitness requirements to complete level one and two? Um, I'm pretty sure that those are online. Those You can find those online uh, on our website. We buy, By the way, we have a beautifully uh, uh, designed a new website, complete new website. And so you will find that information, uh, Ferry, uh, directly on um, movenat.com. So I re-invite you to go to movenat.com and, um, and check out uh, straight there. And our team is super always happy to, uh, uh, you know, receive your emails and any inquiry. We're always happy to tell you, okay, this is what, what you need. Okay, do you need a a level one certification? Should you start with an e-course? Is there any local licensed uh, gym um, where you could go or a, a you know, certified trainer around you that you could start training with? Um, we also have online coaching. So there's plenty of um, possibilities, but uh, definitely the certification is uh, the level one is designed to be um, something that um, a lot of people can physically do, can physically already achieve, 
um, not that much by you know training their their physical uh, like to be super in shape, but but we are already learning fundamental techniques, just you know most basic techniques that um, anyone with you know a functional body uh, can learn and can uh, become able to do pretty quickly with just some some um, some basic but uh, serious training. Somebody asked me what are my thoughts about CrossFit. Honestly, I have not really uh, kept an eye in forever on whatever it is that CrossFit does. Um, what I know is that uh, it's uh, it's a high intensity program, and the truth is that it's, it's, a, it's a truth. It's a reality. It's a fact. It's that in today's society, most people are just not at all ready for high intensity straight off the bat. This is not at all where most people should start. Not only it might be way too intimidating for people to think of themselves, you know, going for such intense workouts and like systemat systematically. Um, but secondly, it might just really, um, <clears throat> you can easily hurt your body doing that. Um, or just become really discouraged. Um, in any case, high intensity is great. It has a place. I do train with high intensity frequently. But a proper way to look at a person's movement behavior, not just fitness training, movement behavior, you know, what you need biologically, physiologically, what's good for you, is that it starts with a lot of low intensity movement it starts with low intensity movement and a f more frequency so more often instead of thinking of okay let's do three super hard workout in a week okay well if your starting point is years of no physical activity or very little physical activity this is not your entry point this is not the best the best would be a greater frequency of movement so more often, every day, a few times a day, some movements, some low-intensity movement with a greater variety of movements. Okay. So um, variety of movement and frequency of movement at low intensity, and then to start with some intensity. That's where literally modern mankind today, that's where they're at. That's where we're at. That's what we need to do, not high intensity. And that's what I like to say, you know, ultimately, whoever is a move natter also trains high intensity. You know, you're going to sprint, you're going to lift heavy, you're going to hold your breath, whatever, climb stuff, jump far, all kind of things like that. But this is not the entry point for most people. And that's what I just what I'd like to say. Um, hi, everybody who is uh, saying hi and um, who is either already certified or just training with us in some way or training on their own somewhere. Um, another question is a brief overview. Yes, somebody's asking about my breath hold work e-course or program. Uh, so, so the word is a little uh, spreading already that uh, I have been working on a new method, which um, overlaps with obviously with uh, MoveNet. So I call it breath hold work, and breath hold work is 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 basically a meditation where you hold your breath as you meditate. So there is a component of it that is breathing, and then breath holding, prolonged breath holding. Um, so this is very exciting. Um, the word is really spreading. A lot of people is, are taking the, the the course. So far, it's a live online program. Uh, I will, whenever I can, turn it into a an, an e-course. Um, you want to know or to remember that since day one in 2009, when I moved to the United States and I 
taught my very first Move Now workshops that was back then in the woods of West Virginia, the very first thing that I ever taught was breathing. I taught nasal, diaphragmatic breathing. I had, you know, all kind of uh, drills to have people understand the function of the breathing, the importance of the breathing. And the reason why was always the first part of my, my teaching was because then we would not just sit and breathe. We were first sitting, lying down and breathing, then kneeling and breathing, and then walking on all fours and breathing. So the point was first isolate breathing, understand how breathing works, control breathing to become uh, able to control one's breathing, one one's thinking about it, one paying attention about it once when you're sitting, but that the progression ultimately was, will you be able to have breathing control when you move, when you're not paying attention to your breathing, when you're paying attention to your movement, especially in nature, when it becomes, you know, like stones and mud and obstacles in the way, if you're going to move <clears throat> that way, move the move that original pure way, you know, like uh, go in the woods and, and move naturally with any level of complexity of the environment and intensity, like speed at which you move and things like that. And if you don't have breathing control, then you'll start painting, you'll start holding your breath, you'll start to just waste your energy. And so the progression was first we isolate movement, uh, I mean, we, are, we do isolate movement as if breathing is a movement, in fact. Breathing is an internal movement. And we isolate that. You learn how to control that breathing. And then it's only really good and fully assimilated the moment that you can move naturally, which is in adaptable fashions, diverse fashions, you know, you move, you jump, then you move on all fours, then you hang and climb, and then you jump again and land and things like that. While well, you control your breathing. If you only have breathing sitting, but not breathing when you move, and especially when you move in complex environments, then you do not have breathing control. So this is already part of MoveNet. It's already part of movement. It's part of a, the teachings, part of the methods, part of the curriculum. With breathful work, I go beyond in the sense that it's it's actually about sitting and even laying down and meditating and understanding neurophysiology, understanding the psyche, and what happens when you hold your breath for a prolonged extent of time. Um, so that's. Um, that's the new uh, method that I'm uh, teaching now. I'll keep looking at any question that I may have missed in the feed. Hello, hello from India. Well, hello from Hawaii. Hello from Oregon. Hello from France. Hi. Okay. Let me know if uh, anyone has any other question. I'm here just waiting for additional questions. Looking at the feed. <laughs> How can we survive in the woods if there are snakes? Because there are so many snakes in the woods of India. I am not familiar with 
such environments. And um, so this is beyond the scope of my expertise, I'm afraid. Um, I'm not a, a specialist in snakes, especially not in venomous snakes. Not that I've not encountered many in my, uh, whenever I've been uh, in, um, that could be the jungle in Peru, uh, that can, or, or Brazil actually, um, that can be also in the desert uh, of New Mexico, lots of rattlesnakes. The good thing is that we can see them from a distance, um, but sometimes they're just coiled and this is just waiting and uh, you may not pay attention to them. If you get too close, you can get bit. So observation number one, then, um, you know, never put your hands where you can't see. Um, scorpions, spiders, snakes, there's always um, this kind of, uh, potential dangers in many environments. Um, well, the best is to first you want to know what's there, what's potentially hidden um, and potentially a threat in those natural environments. You want to ask the locals if you don't know. And then you want to know at least the basic basics of such or such animals, such as uh, species, local species, what's their behavior? Where do they hide? where do they feed at what time what's you know what's what are the warning signs if there is any um how to avoid the threats you know it's uh it's a lot local okay it it can be local it can be seasonal it can so you have to uh you have to ask local people uh somebody's asking me about the translation of the book in french well I really have no idea. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, French are infamous for um, being behind a bit in some in some areas of you know what's what's new, what's going on. Very. Um, uh, I don't know. Anyways, nul n'est prophète dans son pays, as we say in French. Uh, just because I'm originally from France. Uh, doesn't mean that we have yet a a, um, a publisher in French. We have publisher in a, in Polish, in uh, Chinese, in uh, and, uh, German, in uh, also in diverse languages, but not yet in French. So I have no idea when that's going to happen. Uh, Paul is asking what I would say is a good entry start uh, entry start for MoveNet. Uh, well, entry start for MoveNet is that uh, you're already in. You are already in. Everybody moves naturally. Um, every movement anyone does on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, um, standing, walking, sitting, getting up, getting down, lifting something, carrying something. All these movements are natural movements, right? They are not. Uh, they're not part of a of a sport, they're not part of a choreography, they're just practical movements that we do. Uh, the problem is there's much more, many more movements that one is able to do and uh, as a human being, many more natural movements than that and uh, much greater variety and that we should also be doing with enough frequency and also, of course, enough intensity from time to time. So a good starting point is to realize, to, to look at, okay, what is it that I do every day? What's my movement behavior like? What's, what is it that I do with my body on a day-to-day -day basis? And when you realize that you are mostly standing, walking from one seat to the next, and then sitting more and there is not that much variety of your movements not that much frequency or intensity there's also not a lot of variety of environment it's pretty much the same indoors environment everything is you know vertical horizontal linear flat stable predictable that's a great starting point to realize okay that there is for most people 
um, a movement impoverishment, you know, poverty of their movement behavior on a day-to-day -day basis. So how would you enrich that? How would you make it more, your movement more substantial? Well, again, you add variety of movements, you add frequency of movements, and ultimately you may also add a bit of intensity of movement. But number one is variety and frequency. Well, on movenet.com, you'll find uh, I believe also on our YouTube channel, you'll find a, a lot of uh, free samples, you know, movements showing you a variety of movements that you can try doing already. Uh, the book is extremely well done. Also wonderful uh, instruction on a great variety of movements. So there's plenty of ways that you can get started. You know? Just try things, you know, move on all fours do uh, small jumps, hang from some some place where you can hang, just just do these kind of movements and it's a great start. See how it feels, see how comfortable you are. Typically, if you're not feeling so comfortable with those movements that you know, but that they have become new somehow, new to your sensations, new to your body, well, it means that you have not done those movements in a long time. And if you don't feel comfortable, well, that's a good sign that you want to make them become comfortable again. How can we deal with the embarrassments of jump or crawl in a public place with a lot of people? How did you do it? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, that's a great question. Because personally, I, I train exactly the same regardless of if there is nobody around me or if there are people around me. And that's because I've trained to do, I've trained my mind, you know, it's my, my, my mind, my psychology, my own psyche to do what is good for me. So when I train, I will train the same regardless of having nobody around me or people around me. And why is that? It's because my practice is not about being seen or not seen. It's not about anybody else, but what it is that my biology, my neurology, my whole body and mind and spirit and heart need. I need that movement. I need that physical competency. I need all the neurotransmitters, the, all you know, all the, the cascade of beneficial adaptations for you know the brain for the, the body that will result from that practice i need the feeling of satisfaction in the very moment when i do the movement it is already satisfying <clears throat> i need that nobody's opinion is going to change anything think of it this way is it what people think of you that is potentially a limitation to your physical expression, to your personal freedom of movement? Is it what they may think of you? Or is it what you think that they may think of you that they maybe don't even think, right? So is it happening in their head or is it happening in your head? So how much freedom do you have? How much freedom do you want? How much freedom do you give yourself? I give myself the freedom to be free of whatever anyone thinks because while i am moving i am expressing my vitality i am strengthening my vitality and i'm using my freedom whatever reaction whatever thought about that whatever opinion is on them it's not on me whatever they may think of the people does not impact and affect me. I am free of it. I'm free of that. And that's a very important aspect of practice because if you're going to wait for everybody's validation or if you're going to wait that nobody's watching or if you're going to be uh, limited by you know what people think, then... You know, what's the end of that? You know, at what point do you choose to just be you? 
just be you and express who you've chosen to be, including through the kind of movement that you've chosen to perform and practice. All right, so the answer is in you. It's not in anybody else. The answer is in you. Just take that freedom. Be that freedom. And um, it's trainable. Just, just detach yourself from whatever. And by the way, I'm going to finish on, on that. <clears throat> we may, even when we think of what other people may think, okay, they see me crawl and I'm a grown up. So what's a grown up doing crawling on the ground? You know, like that's unusual. And that's me doing it. Oh my God, what are people going to think? You may think of some people thinking negatively about it. But what if you are actually completely inspiring people? What if somehow you're giving them permission? What if the next day they're going to try the same? Or maybe, you know, weeks later. Um, weeks later, they'll be like, wow, I remember that guy or that woman, the person doing this, walking on all fours, hanging from a tree branch. That was interesting. Yeah, you know, it looks like the person was enjoying themselves. How, how about I do the same? How about I try it? You know, so you never know. Think of that too. Um, um, I see that you run barefoot long distances in rugged wilderness terrains, which is usually a recipe for bruises and bleeding for most people. Is this something that simply get better as you become more efficient in movement? All right, so number one, running barefoot. <clears throat> running barefoot. Um, who is running barefoot? What is what's what is their technique? What is the their tissues like? You know, are they going to be bruised easily? You know, they have. You know, um, there's an aspect of training that's not um, just technique. And uh, there's an aspect of training that's not just physical condition, but the strength, the health of your feet, obviously, is very important. And then the technique, how do you land on you know, each step? Then how fast do you run? Then how long do you run? Then um, on what terrain do you run? You know, if you run on sand, if you run on grass, if you run on mud, if you run on gravel, if you run on on stones, you know, it's it's all very different. So there's no uh, one size fits all answer to that. Um, first off, it's we recommend to run with, you know, what's called minimal shoes um, when it when it comes to running in nature. You probably want to go with at least minimal shoes, if not your regular shoes to begin with. Sometimes that it, it really depends. So there's no straight answer to that. All I can say is that it's a progression, and it's also not like anybody has to ultimately think of themselves being able to run barefoot on any terrain. That's a great goal, um, and that's a possibility, definitely, but absolutely not a starting point or a preoccupation in the beginning. You know, if you can just start doing a variety of movements barefoot on just, you know, flat floors, on floors or on flat grounds or, you know, non-challenging grounds outside, it's great. It's great. See how your feet do or, you know, see how you feel in your body. I'm going to wait just a bit for maybe a, a, a last question. What about barefoot running when it gets cold? Well, well, well. Um, you have to be very cautious with that one. Okay. So, uh, it's, it's to run in snow or on ice or anything frozen is hardcore, all right? So it's hardcore. 
So um, definitely not a beginner or not even an intermediate practitioner kind of concern. Uh, snow, so because there's a difference. Snow, ice is not exactly the same, but cold. Well, they, they can really, uh, you know, make your, your, your extremities numb and then block the circulation. And ultimately, you can really get numb. You know, that's really, that's bad. You can really, uh, it happened to me once. And then I, I ultimately recovered complete sensitivity in, uh, in my toes. But I had two toes that, you know, got numb for, uh, for several weeks. All right. So being healthy, living healthy, it, it, it all came back. But the problem is that if you go in the snow and at first it will get cold and then at some point you may not even really feel that your feet are frozen because they're numb. And uh, when, uh, when you realize that, it may be already a little too late. Uh, ice and especially uh, frozen mud is the worst because it will not numb your whole foot. It will just numb the lower, you know, the, the, the layer of skin, you know, the, your natural soul, basically, the thick callus of your feet. will numb it a bit. It will also do what water does, which is when you spend a lot of time in water, your skin does what's called, you know, pruning. It becomes soft and like um, wrinkly and soft. And now you're running on a frozen, uneven ground. So whenever you run, you multiply, depending on your speed, you multiply your body weight by two or three. Each time you land on the ball of your foot and then that skin becomes soft. And now you're, you're stepping, even if you step light, you still have more body weight in that little area on skin that has become soft. And you know what happens? It tears. It will tear. And you may not even feel it because it will be numbed by the ice. All right, so be very, very cautious, everybody, with... Uh, running or doing any uh, barefoot training in the winter, in the cold out there, okay? It can be a bad surprise. So just, just pay attention. Um, how would you express clinical benefits with these movements to medical professionals? All right, so I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. I have always observed since day one people with some conditions, some pain, some some misalignment, some some physical issues that they had. Tell me, well, this is gone. It's gone, or it's much better than it was in just a few days of practice. And there's something about what's our physical, you know, original, biological, universal evolutionary physical behavior that is natural movement what does it do to your body when you don't have that behavior when your natural movement has been shrunk to just basically again standing walking a few steps and sitting and you do that most days and when all the rest is missing all the rest of your otherwise natural movement behavior that should be so diverse what does it do to your body in, in, in a detrimental fashion. It's obviously very detrimental to everybody's body, everyone's body, their physiology, their function. And also, also naturally, what happens when you restore this natural movement behavior? Again, in terms of diversity of movements, frequency of movements, complexity of movements and, and then intensity of movement. And so we've seen amazing results uh, in people's, you know, physical health, general health improvement, functional health, physiological health, including mental health as well. And we now have a medical board. So basically we have uh, 
a group of uh, um, doctors, um, healthcare practitioners that are highly knowledgeable and competent. And we have now um, a special board that is studying um, the, the combination of natural movement practice with specific therapies. Uh, and that's highly promising. So I'm very, very proud of my, you know, uh, my team and our company and our community to, to push this forward. It's very exciting. Yeah. And John just, um, yeah, it's called move Net medical nutrition. What do I recommend? Okay. Well, so that's, um, what do I personally recommend? I recommend, Okay, number one, you want to look at clean food. Okay, so that's food that's food that is minimally processed or completely unprocessed. It means that you, when you go buy your food, it looks like food. It looks like a potato. It looks like a, you know, it looks like a cheese. It looks like a meat. It looks like a fruit. It looks like a veggie. It looks like a nut. It looks like something real, something that comes from nature, or something that maybe has been processed but very minimally something that you will have to cook, something that is fresh, not in a box, something that you have to cook, like eggs, um, and ideally something that is local and seasonal. So that's my, uh, my, my advice. All right. All right. Unless there is a very one last question, I will um, I'll say goodbye. It's been a, a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, how to become oh, okay? How to become a certified instruction from home? Well, you, you can't really become a certified instruction uh, instructor from home. You can try from home. You can study from home, but ultimately you have to um, come attend a workshop with us, where our master instru instructors can uh, see the way you personally move understand you know assess what's your understanding of movement biomechanics, biomechanics physiology some basic knowledge that you want to know and also we want to see you teach we want to see you go through a number of tests where you are you know you're presented with um you know people having trouble with such or such movement you know doing the movement in inefficient ways where you have to be able to spot what's going on and give them cues on, you know, what they need to do. You'll be tested on, you know, how do you train a group? How do you train one-on-one? -on -one, things like that. So um, that part you cannot do from home. So there's a lot you can do from home. You can study the whole curriculum from home. You can train a lot of movement from home. You can look at videos and, but ultimately you need to, we need to see you, we need to meet you in person and, um, and that's how you become certified. Uh, somebody's asking if that's a replay. No, it's not a replay. Uh, this is live. Um, if you're watching it right now. Um, Thank you for all the nice comments that I've uh, seen in the feed. I really appreciate. Thank you so much, everybody. And um, I hope that you join us, our community. And um, I hope that you keep practicing um, what is your birthright of physical capability, real-world physical capability. So wherever you are, whoever you are, uh, whichever 
level of practice you are, uh, remember that the natural movement is already in you. It's already part of who you are, of what you do to some extent. And what we invite you to do is to start considering how you enrich, how you re-expand your physical behavior, movement behavior on a day-to-day -day basis to a much greater scope, to having much more variety and, and frequency, and hopefully and, 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 and ultimately to find yourself practicing those movements out there in nature um, when you feel free where you feel the energies of the earth, of the river, of the trees, of the sky, everything that is, in fact, everybody's home, the planet Earth, where you can thrive, where um, nobody cares about differences that seem to separate us and divide us and isolate us. When you move in nature, when you're in nature, you're doing that movement, you're just simply being human. And that alone is enough. And that alone is, is beautiful. All right. I wish everybody well. Uh, be safe out there. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention. And until next time, be well.